So um, thank you. I'm going to talk about the, uh, what I call the do-it-yourself city. And I want to share with you some lessons that I learned. I'm from New York, as uh, was said, and uh, some lessons that I learned that turned the way that I see cities completely upside down. I'm going to argue here today that many things that we think of as problems, squatting, stealing, street selling, smuggling, and piracy are all super important for the cities of the future. So I'll start with squatting. Now, this is Kibera in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, crude mud hut. And uh, this is a squatter settlement in Borovali National Park in Mumbai, India. Uh, this man is preparing for the monsoon. And uh, this is a rather tidy one-family squatter building, self-built housing on the outskirts of Istanbul in Turkey. And uh, this is a sort of neighborhood scape of Hosinia, uh, one of the largest favelas in Rio de Janeiro. And the reason why I say that squatting, self-building, doing what these people did is a social good is because of this, urban growth. The world's cities are growing by 60 million people a year. And uh, if you do the math, basically it's two people every second. Now, there's no government, no developer, no private business that's going to build housing at the rate that is necessary for the 60 million people that are coming every year. Um, so people have to build it themselves. So my contention is that squatting prevents homelessness. It's creating the urban neighborhoods of the future. Now, second thing, stealing. In Rio, the minute people create a favela, they do this. They steal electricity. And I contend that this is a social good. Why? Because the minute they steal electricity, they can steal water. And uh, this shows that that little box there in the center of the image is a pump, electric pump. And they pump water up the hill. The favelas are on the hillsides with a great view overlooking the beaches. And they pump water up into, you can see all these runs of plastic pipe, and uh, into kaishas or tanks on their roof, and the houses are gravity fed. Now, why is this a good thing? Well, basically, having electricity means that they're much less likely to set fire to their homes. This is a statistic from South Africa. Um, Squatter homes burn, and mostly they burn because of candles and kerosene lanterns. And uh, with electricity, you don't need candles and kerosene lanterns. And so stealing electricity when the government won't provide it to you is a good thing. And also, uh, waterborne diseases kill two million people every year. So by stealing water, uh, squatters are ensuring that they have access to good, high-quality, potable water. And that means less people die. So that's a social good. Now, um, smuggling, street selling, and piracy. Uh, I was recently in Lagos, Nigeria, and all the mobile phone companies were totally ecstatic. I was at a comp business conference, and they were talking about how, look at this curve. I mean, African usage of mobile phones is just wonderful. It's the most amazing thing. They've leapfrogged the landline. And uh, Nokia was crowing about it, and some of the mobile phone providers were crowing about it. And in reality, they had nothing to do with it. The business model is pay-as-you-go, uh, prepaid cards. And those prepaid cards are sold by people on the street, a totally unincorporated, unregistered, unlicensed workforce that sells these cards, and you can see these umbrellas. It's called the umbrella market. And the mobile phone companies make 90% of their profits because of people like this. They don't sell you the phone. They don't sell you fancy monthly plans. Um, these are the people who sell you your recharge cards, and that's how mobile companies make money. These are totally illegal, unlicensed businesses. At the same time, how do people get the phone? Well, they get the phone through smuggling. And I found that out by going to China. I went to Guangzhou, China, and I went to the Guangzhou Da Chateau Secondhand Trade Center. Basically, I got to Guangzhou, and I followed some Africans and uh, discovered this place. 
Um, it, this is a place that doesn't sell secondhand phones at all. It actually sells what's called Shanjai or pirated phones. And uh, I followed these guys when they were coming out, and the boxes are going to Eddie in Lagos. Um, and you can tell from that that th this is not being sent uh, via normal channels. He's not paying customs duty on this. I tried to call Eddie, and uh, he... <laughs> He didn't answer the phone when I was in Lagos, but I did meet uh, another fellow the same day when I was at the market, Chief Arthur O'Coffer. And Chief Arthur was ecstatic because he had come to Guangzhou with $40,000 and bought pirated Nokia mobile phones. Although he refused to admit that they were pirated, he refused to admit that they were fakes, he called them real copies. <laughs> and what, what real copies did was that they drove down the price to a price that people could afford. Thus, the spread of mobile phones throughout Nigeria and throughout Africa. And it forced the mobile phone companies to compete. So two months ago, I was in Lagos, and I was pleased to note that the cheapest Nokia phone available for people was $19. So Nokia has recognized that they have to compete on price with the pirated phones and exploit that market. And Nokia did another really interesting thing. Mobile phone service throughout Africa is very spotty, and you need different services if you're in different parts of the country. And people were carrying two and sometimes three mobile phones. And the pirate manufacturers started making fake Nokias that took two and three SIM cards. And Nokia realized, hey, that's a good idea. And so Nokia pirated the pirates. <laughs> and Nokia now makes mobile phones that take two and three SIM cards. So you only need one phone, and you can shift between your different lines like call waiting. So Nokia has competed with the pirates, and they are making money selling these very cheap uh, and effective mobile phones throughout Africa. So smuggling, street selling, piracy, all uh, incredible social goods. So, China, right? They don't have intellectual property rights. There's Versace without the vowels, and Joe Mani instead of Armani, and S. Gucci. Um, and there was also, uh, in the same mall, there was a store called Hogu Boss, and uh, a firm that made leather wallets and keychains under the name Alicia Keys. And, you know, I don't think Alicia Keys is ever going to sue Alicia Keys in China. Um, no one's confusing the two of them. No one's going to confuse Gucci with Gucci. Um, and indeed, studies have been done that show that people see the pirated product as simply one more item on the value chain. So that Chinese consumers and African consumers recognize when they're buying a pirated product. And if they have the money, they'll buy the real product. But when they don't have the money, they'll consider the pirated product because it might be a good value for them. And so I don't think that this is an issue that's going to impact, that is impacting the big brands in the way they say. And I tested that thought out because I was at a conference in Kenya and uh, there was an executive from a major sneaker manufacturer who was there. And uh, we were having drinks after the conference, and I said to him, so, tell me, what's the deal about piracy? And he said, I'll tell you, but you can never mention my name, and if you ever do, I have to kill you. <laughs> and I said, okay. And so I can't tell you his name, but I can tell you what he said, which is, we need piracy. Piracy for us is market research. If we make a sneaker and it's not being pirated, we know before we get the sales data that it's a failure in the marketplace and we have to redo our sneakers. So the big brands are using piracy as uh, market research. It's one more piece of the puzzle for them in solving how they're going to sell more of their products around the world. And if you go to street markets, this is a street market in Sao Paulo, Brazil, uh, on Rua Vinci Cinco de Marzo. It's no longer there because the government has been very punitive towards street markets. But you can get pirated designer sunglasses, you can get cloned cologne, you can get pirated DVDs, you can get fake baseball caps in all sorts of different colors, you can get underground underwear, and even pirated evangelical CDs. Um, 
So, you know, this is happening openly. It's not hidden from anyone, and it's going on all around the world, and I contend that we shouldn't be scared of it. People are only buying the pirated thing because they can't afford the real thing. Um, now, this is really important for the cities of the developing world because half the people in the world are working off the books or in the economy that I call System D, which I've pirated myself from the French-speaking colonies, former French-speaking colonies in Africa and the Caribbean, who borrow the word débriardis, which is a French word that means self-reliance, and what academics tend to call the informal economy, they call l'économie de la débriardise, or système D, system D. And I like that, because it takes away this kind of uh, criminal, underground kind of feel to it, and makes it a system. And so I've pirated the word. And the employment is going up in system D, so it'll soon be two-thirds of the workers of the world. So this is a hugely important component, and you can't talk about economic development of cities, particularly in the developing world, which is where urban growth is occurring and where 50% of the economic growth in the coming two decades will be located. You can't talk about economic development without talking about this economy. Now, um, that means that we have to turn upside down our ideas about all these images that I'm showing you. Um, this is not an image of urban misery. This is a store in Makoko. Uh, this lady is selling food, and in a community built out over the water, you don't just walk down the street to the store. The store comes to you on a boat. Uh, this is not the worst horrible open sewer you've ever seen. This is a butcher shop and restaurant in Kibera. We have to understand the street and the value that this has to the people who are working there. Um, this is a business incubator in Lagos, Nigeria, and I found that out from Andrew Saboru, who spent 16 years as a dump scavenger there, turned himself into a contract scaler, so he was paid by trash brokers to walk around and weigh all the recycled materials, and then earned enough money to turn himself into a recycling dealer himself, and that's his depot behind him. And he earns twice the minimum wage in Nigeria from working there. And he thinks the future is bright. He just needs more capital. He makes a 20% return on investment. He just needs more money to be able to grow his business. Um, this is a shopping mall, linear shopping mall along the train line in Kibera. This is Main Street, also in Kibera. Um, this is... Kibera surprised me in, in Nairobi because it's a mud hut shanty town, but there's businesses lining the streets, hundreds and hundreds of businesses. And so we have to begin to understand that these are valuable to the people who live there. And when you trash these communities, you deprive people not only of homes, but of livelihoods. Um, this, interestingly enough, is a multinational business. Um, these guys are selling the Gala sausage roll. Gala is made by UAC Foods, which is a legal company that's traded on the Nigerian Stock Exchange. But for this product, which has existed for 40 years, you won't find it in stores. They only sell it through System D, through informal street hawkers who run around the traffic jams of Lagos selling the Gala sausage roll. Um, and this is globalization because this lady, Ogun Dairo, who's also in Makoko, smokes fish for a living, and I asked her, where does the fish come from? And I was totally amazed when she told me, Europe. <laughs> um, it's caught in the North Sea, frozen, shipped down to Lagos, Nigeria, smoked in the worst community in town, and sold on the street for pennies. So that's a global business chain. Now, if we totaled up in one country the value of System D, the informal economy, it would be $10 trillion a year. And that would make it, if it were a single country, the second largest economy in the world after the United States. Um, just to give you a comparison, the luxury economy that everyone pursues, Xenia and uh, all the global brands that were pirated that I told you, is much smaller than this. Uh, the informal economy on the street is seven times bigger than the luxury economy. So this is where economic development needs to go. 
Now, why am I talking about all this? I'm talking about all this for this number, $2,138. And for those who aren't good in math, it's 1,652 euros. What does this number symbolize? Um, if any of you have access to assets of 1,652 euros, a car, a house, a series of fancy electronic devices, assets, could be cash in the bank too. If any of you has access to that, you are to be congratulated because you are one of the 50% wealthiest people on the planet. System D, the informal economy, the squatter communities, they represent the other 50%. And they're super important in the development of an equitable system where people can grow and grow their businesses and grow their families and become stable members of society. And that's what we're all talking about. We need equitable development. Um, and so, my thought is that whatever economic revolution has to happen, and I do believe an economic revolution does have to happen, it has to come from the bottom. And so I'll leave you with a quote from the great Argentine author Roberto Arlt, who asked, who is going to make the social revolution if it's not the swindlers, the wretched, the murderers, the cheats, all the scum that suffer here below without the slightest sign of hope? These are the folks who are going to make that social revolution and make a better world and better cities possible. Thank you very much. Thanks.